Good afternoon. I'm Mia Monroe, and I'm an attorney at the Jeannie Harrison Law Firm. I'm honored to be moderating this amazing panel today about the Private Attorneys General Act, or PAGA. For today's presentation, attendees can ask questions in the Q&A box on the side of the Zoom chat, and the panelists will try to answer the questions during the presentation. Program material was emailed to attendees, and there will also be a link posted to the chat. MCLE certificates, will be automatically sent to attendees within 24 hours. Our two panelists today are George Abel and Chris Jalian. George Abel is a partner in the employment law practice of Paul Hastings. He divides his practice among employment advice and litigation, disaster mitigation, and appellate practices. Mr. Abel's employment advice and litigation practice includes the representation of private and public employers in all aspects of employment law, including wage and hour class actions, wrongful discharge, discrimination, sexual harassment, traditional labor arbitrations, and private arbitrations. He has particular experience in wage and hour class actions and PAGA representative actions, and he has extensive appellate practice. Chris Jalian is an associate at the employment law practice of Paul Hastings. Mr. Jalian represents employers in all aspects of labor and employment law, including wage and hour matters and discrimination. He has experience with class and representative actions, multi-plaintiff and single plaintiff lawsuits, defending employers in state and federal court in cases involving discrimination, equal pay, whistleblower, labor law, and wage and hour laws. Mr. Jalian has also counseled clients to ensure compliance with wage and hour requirements. Uh, George and Chris, you can take it away now. Thank you very much, Mia, and thank you to all of you for uh, attending. Um, we understand we have a, a large group here today, so thank you all for, for joining us. Um, Chris and I have been speaking to uh, the Beverly Hills Bar Association for several years now on the Private Attorneys General Act, or PAGA, and um, each year there's something new to talk about, and even though the, the lawsuit is, uh, the, the litigation, the statute has been around for um, more than 15 years now, um, we always always find new topics to, to consider. We're going to um, spend some time going through kind of the the, uh, the underlying portions of the act and 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 um, make sure everyone is um, familiar with with uh, the ins and outs of the of the statute, um, and then also get into some of the specific issues that we've seen arise uh, over the years. Um, the materials that you've been provided, uh, you'll, you'll have these uh, slides available to you so that you can uh, have those for future reference. Uh, we also provided a list of some of the more uh, salient cases that, uh, that are, tend to come up in our discussion of, of PAGA. And so uh, you'll have citations to those to the extent that they're not in the slides themselves. Uh, there's a separate listing uh, that contains those cases. So we'll jump right into it. If we could go to the first slide, thank you. Um, we thought we'd start with kind of a, a background of, of what existed before PAGA. So pre-2004, um, how was the labor code set up? And that, that provides a good foundation for understanding what, what PAGA did and, and why some of the uh, issues that we see being litigated uh, have come about. So before PAGA existed, um, the labor code provided for two different types of penalties. There were statutory penalties that individuals could recover through a private right of action. And then there were also civil penalties uh, in some instances. Um, and only the California Labor Commissioner could recover civil penalties by bringing an action against a particular employer. 
And in 2004, the California legislature concluded that the California Labor Commissioner didn't have the resources to uh, enforce the labor code to the extent the legislature liked. And so that is why it decided to uh, pass the PAGA legislation to give individuals uh, an opportunity to help enforce the labor code uh, statutes. And so PAGA really did did two things. Um, and it's a lengthy statute, but it, the, 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 ball, the bottom line is it really accomplished two goals. It gave individuals uh, the opportunity to go after employers for civil penalties that previously only the labor commissioner could get. But it also imposed civil penalties in instances where they didn't already exist. So many of the labor code provisions um, didn't have a civil penalty associated with them. And so PAGA uh, imposed this um, additional opportunity for the availability of civil penalties uh, for those labor code sections that didn't already have them. So really you can see that, that what PAGA did right off the bat was really provide the potential for what many people call double recovery uh, of both statutory and civil penalties. Um, and we see that come about uh, in, in Labor Code 226 in particular. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a quick aside here. Labor Code 226 is the section that requires certain uh, pieces of information to be available on way, uh, employer employees' wage statements. Um, and the unique aspect of Section 226 is there is a subsection of 226 called Labor Code Section 226E, which provides for damages and statutory penalties. So an individual can go after those uh, on their own. There's also a section 226.3, which provides a civil penalty for violating portions of section 226A. And so right there you have uh, circumstances where there's both a statutory and a civil penalty. And the, one of the interesting uh, ways that's uh, been addressed in litigation is the statutory penalty that's available under 226E requires an individual to show injury uh, and intentional conduct on the part of the employer. And there has been litigation in connection with seeking recovery of PAGA penalties for a violation of 226. And courts have said that that injury and intentional aspect to recover the statutory penalty is not required um, when you're seeking to recover the, the civil penalty uh, through PAGA. And so you have right there a, a split between um, what kinds of uh, evidence you need to demonstrate in order to recover both statutory and civil penalties. And so you can see why there's significant litigation over this issue. Um, and, and that has been, um, one, one aspect that we've seen, seen a fair amount of litigation. Another one is um, the potential for individual liability and the statute does, uh, does provide for that. Of course, there's, there's one of the cases we cited in our uh, list of, of, of cases that you might wanna look at is the Atempa, A-T-E-M-P-A versus Pedrozani case. And that um, court held that where the owner of a company was uh, so involved in making the determinations regarding wage and hour uh, compliance that, that the individual himself could be liable for, uh, for penalties under PAGA. So let's turn next to the next slide and, and kind of look at um, what PAGA did and, and how you go about um, bringing a lawsuit under PAGA. So the, the statute really provided um, several prerequisites for bringing suit. Um, there are several things that a plaintiff must do before he or she can bring a PAGA action. And there's really two paths and we go into those in detail in the next slide, please. So on the, on the next slide, you'll see that there's their labor code section 2699.5 lists a series of labor code provisions. And if you want to bring a claim under PAGA with regard to one of those provisions listed in 2699.5, then you have to first provide notice to the Labor and Workforce Development Agency uh, that you and to the employer that you intend to sue. 
And initially when PAGA first came out, the obligation was that you provide this notice by certified mail to both the LWDA and the employer. Since then it's been revised. The notice to the LWDA is now an online notice. Uh, you still have to provide notice to the employer by certified mail. And then before you can bring a lawsuit under PAGA, you have to let the LWDA decide whether or not it wants to investigate this alleged uh, violation of the statutes that you've alerted them to. Uh, they have 120 days to investigate if they decide to do so. Um, there are very few instances in my experience where the LWDA actually has gone ahead and uh, investigated, um, but it is a procedural requirement. So you do have to provide the notice uh, and you do have to uh, allow the LWDA either to tell you that they intend to provide uh, or investigate the matter or that they don't intend to investigate or in what we see in most instances, they just never respond at all. Uh, and as long as you let the time expire, then, then you will have satisfied the prerequisites. Let's talk about the second path. So there are um, a host of labor code provisions that are not listed in 2699.5, although not many, because the legislature was very um, uh, thorough in listing uh, the sections that they wanted to be covered under 2699.5. But there are some that are not there. And if the underlying violation that you seek to bring a case about involves one of those, then there's a different set of prerequisites. You do have to provide the same notice to the LWDA and to the employer uh, of your intent to bring a lawsuit. But in those instances, you have to give the employer an opportunity to cure the violation. So the legislature decided that there were some labor code violations that were small enough, if you will, uh, that could be fixed and that didn't create immediate harm. And so they wanted the employers to have an opportunity to fix those uh, violations or cure those violations before a lawsuit could be brought. The interesting piece of that, though, is the legislature didn't give employers a whole lot of time to, um, to cure those violations. It's only 33 days. Um, and so you can imagine um, that uh, it would be very difficult in many instances for employers to um, in, impose that cure, take care of that cure within that time frame. In particular, uh, the slide points out there's uh, an opportunity to cure Labor Code's uh, Section 226, subsections A6 and A8. Those subsections of 226 are the portions of the wage statement statute that require inclusive dates of employment and, and the name and address of the employer. Um, the legislature specifically called those two out as being something that an employer should be able to cure if they're notified of a violation uh, and, and fix it uh, before a lawsuit can be brought. The interesting piece about that though, this the PAGAS expressly says that in order to cure those particular subsections, the employer needs to provide a corrected wage statement for every aggrieved employee going back three years. And so you can imagine the difficulty that an employer would face if it has hundreds or thousands of employees about providing cured wage statements over the, the prior three years, all in a 33 day period. Um, so it's a very difficult uh, standard to meet, but it does, it, it does exist. So let's um, turn for a minute to, to focus on that first path. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, um, that first path is the one that's most frequently taken where um, there's a, a labor code section that's alleged to have been violated and it's listed in 2699.5. And so you have to, in order to bring a lawsuit, as I said, send the, the notice to the LWDA and a letter to the employer by certified mail that states under the language of the statute, the facts and theories of the lawsuit. And this has been an area of uh, significant litigation over the years. Uh, in the early years of PAGA, um, many submitted these letters uh, and simply listed the statutes and said, this is what the statutes require. The employer hasn't followed them, so we intend to bring suit. And employers have had success in challenging such letters as insufficiently stating the facts and theories uh, on which they intended to sue. 
And so there are dozens of cases going both ways on this issue. Um, we've pointed out a couple on the slide here. The Al Kantar case uh, out of the Ninth Circuit from a few years ago found the facts and theories insufficient to uh, satisfy the exhaustion requirement. And so the PAGA claim uh, was dismissed. Whereas the recent Rojas Cifuentes case, uh, the California Court of Appeal found that the facts and theories were sufficiently stated in the exhaustion letter to the LWDA. And so this is an issue that's uh, of sub is, is something that as plaintiffs, you wanna make sure that you have adequately uh, stated your facts and theories. Uh, and, and as uh, employers, you want to look at that letter closely and see whether uh, they, they have satisfied the, the, the facts and theories um, exhaustion requirement. Um, there are employers will focus on, on several aspects. You know, did they mention the actual statute that, that was alleged to have been violated? Did they, uh, does, does the letter mention the employees who are, are alleged to have been aggrieved? Um, does the letter simply recite what the statutes are and that they've been violated without getting into any details or facts about how they were violated? And so those are, so those are some of the things that employers will want to look at closely to see if they can kind of nip the PAGA claim in the bud, if you will, by, by focusing on the exhaustion letter uh, and whether the exhaustion has sufficiently been, been met. So that's kind of a background of what the statute itself says and, and the initial things you need to do to, to bring a lawsuit in, in the first place. So we're gonna transition it over to Chris now and talk about the actual lawsuit itself um, and, and how COVID has impacted the, the PAGA landscape uh, over the past year. Chris? Thank you, George. Uh, before I do that, we received a question. Um, the question is, can an employer persuade the LWDA to take on the matter or will they always allow private plaintiffs counsel to proceed? Uh, in my, go ahead, George. I was gonna say, it's a great question. Um, and, and it's something that employers often tr you know, may try to do. It, it helps if you have a contact at the LWDA that, that you could um, suggest, you know, this might be something they look into. Um, but I think, you know, in a lot of instances, the LWDA is not likely to uh, taken on just because of a lack of resources. But Chris, your experience may be different. Oh, no, that's that's exactly right. So I've written to the LWDA on behalf of employers that have received PAGA letters. I, I never received a response to any of uh, the letters I've written. So in my experience, they're going to allow the private plaintiff to proceed. I see. Thank you, Chris. That, that's, uh, that seems to be consistent with all of our experiences. There's another question that I see about if you want to attack the letter, would it be through motion or demur, uh, we've done it right up front um, on a demur. It, it often, you know, the, the um, exhaustion letter is often attached to a complaint. And so if it's insufficient, you should be able to attack it through course of, uh, through course of a demur as well. But with respect to attacking a PAGA letter, um, it will have to t take place after the complaint is filed. Correct. So um, there is a, in the last few years when we gave this discussion, we only talked about these two paths, but now uh, during the COVID era, there is what is emerging to be a more frequently used third path to bring the PAGA claim. And that is a PAGA claim uh, alleging uh, Cal OSHA violations. So in addition to the wage and hour violations, PAGA permits an aggrieved employee to bring a representative action for civil penalties for certain Cal OSHA violations. The PAGA statute specifically identifies labor code section 6400, 6401, 6401.7, 6402, and 6403, uh, which largely pertain to an employer's alleged failure to provide a uh, workplace uh, that is safe and healthy failure to implement and maintain an effective uh, uh, injury prevention programs and failure to provide adequate safety equipment. Uh, PAGA claims alleging Cal OSHA violations were rare. In fact, uh, the last time I checked Lexis, which was really early on in the beginning of this pandemic, there were only a handful of decisions even addressing this claim. Most of them were being dismissed. But uh, 
we are seeing an increase in these type of claims dur during and as a result of COVID-19. Um, the cases are alleging that uh, the employer failed to mandate social distancing. Uh, the employer didn't provide masks or didn't provide hand sanitizer um, or didn't establish a practice or policy for infection prevention. Now, the exhaustion process for a Cal OSHA PAGA claim is a bit different than the wage and hour PAGA claims. Uh, notice must be provided to the LWDA, but it also must be provided to the Division of Occupational Health and Safety. The division then has uh, three days to inspect a serious violation or 14 days to inspect a non-serious violation. If the division does not conduct an investigation, the employee can file suit. If the division does inspect, but does not issue a citation within six months, then the employee can file suit. Or if the division inspects and issues a citation, then the employee cannot file a lawsuit. Uh, and much like the some of the labor code provisions uh, that George mentioned, uh, the employers do have some ability to cure these violations. Um, but still, these claims are still rare, uh, and there are a few, the few filed cases are in their very early stages. Uh, maybe next year. We will have more to report on these types of claims and how they're cured and, and what employers are doing to deal with them. But for now, the rest of our discussion on PAGA will focus on the wage and hour violations. Next slide, please. So you've submitted your notice to the LWDA. You've waited the 65 days or the 33 days if it was something that could be cured. And the LWDA does not respond because they rarely do. And now you're ready to file your lawsuit. To validly state a PAGA claim in a civil action, a plaintiff must include at least these three elements. They must plead exhaustion, they must identify the aggrieved employees, and they must plead facts sufficient to support the underlying labor code violation. I'm gonna take each of these in turn and provide a little bit more detail. So for the first element, pleading exhaustion, uh, the plaintiff must plead enough facts to, put, to notify the court that she did in fact exhaust with the LWDA and waited the requisite number of days before filing. Uh, in my experience, the best practice here is for the plaintiff to plead the date on which she sent the LWDA letter, state the LWDA did not respond, and state the facts and theories on which her LWDA notice was based. Alternatively, I've seen plaintiffs uh, attach a copy of their LWDA notice uh, to the complaint and simply plead the date that the letter was mailed, but uh, attaching the copy is not uh, a necessary element to pleading exha exhaustion. Uh, the second element of a proper PAGA filing, and George touched on it briefly, is that uh, you must identify the other allegedly aggrieved employees. Courts historically held that the plaintiff cannot try to represent all aggrieved employees that there must be some specificity to put the employer on notice of the scope of the aggrieved employee group. But recent cases uh, have sort of clawed that back a little bit and have allowed plaintiffs to plead on behalf of all non-exempt employees. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Zayers, uh, the court held that it was sufficient for the plaintiff to seek to represent 3,450 non-exempt employees that were divided into different crews and different jobs across 10 different unions. Um, and that doesn't mean that that pleading is not gonna be challenged for being unmanageable. And that's something George will talk about later today. It's just gonna get, it might get past the pleading stage. Um, still, I think the best practice is to provide some specificity as to who the persons are that the plaintiffs seek to represent. And I think the most effective way to do this is to for the plaintiff to plead the job titles or the job duties of the employees he seeks to represent. Uh, there have been several cases that have found uh, pl the plaintiff's identification of aggrieved employees to be deficient. Um, the first was uh, Kahn versus Dunn Edwards. Uh, and in that case, a summary judgment was granted for the employer because the plaintiff failed to specify or even reference the claims of any other aggrieved employees and did not identify any other current or former aggrieved employee. 
Uh, and the second is JESC versus Maxim Healthcare Services. And in that case, the definition of aggrieved employees was a fail-safe definition, meaning uh, the definition was predicated on the occurrence of the underlying labor code violation. For example, aggrieved employees are all employees who were not authorized or permitted to take rest breaks. Uh, a court likely will find that such a definition is deficient and did not put the LWDA or the employer on notice as to who the aggrieved employer, employees are. Um, a practice tip for both employers and plaintiffs, uh, the complaint cannot exceed the scope of the PAGA letter. So if the PAGA letter is limited to one group of employees, the complaint should be limited to that same group of employees. It can't be expanded beyond that. The third element of a valid PAGA pleading is uh, setting forth the necessary uh, facts to support the underlying labor code violations. So the viability of a PAGA claim tracks the viability of the underlying labor code claim. For example, if a plaintiff cannot plead a valid meal period violation, then the plaintiff cannot seek PAGA penalties for a purported meal period violation. Uh, and this was an issue in uh, Mendoza versus Nordstrom, a case out of the Ninth Circuit. There, uh, the Ninth Circuit affirmed dismissal of the plaintiff's PAGA claim because the plaintiff could not establish the underlying violation, which was that the employer did not entitle her to one day of rest in seven days of work. And she couldn't meet this element because she simply didn't work the requisite number of hours to trigger the statute. Um, and so the court dismissed the case. Uh, and an interesting note about Mendoza, the court noted that even if the plaintiff in that case were to identify an additional party that was entitled to one day of rest and seven days of work and did not receive one day in rest and seven days of work, the court would not permit the plaintiff to substitute or add a new PAGO representative without them again going through this exhaustion process. <clears throat> and finally, some courts have created, I'm going to call it a fourth element for now, uh, to a proper PAGA pleading. And uh, that is that the plaintiff needs to plead facts necessary to proceed on a representative basis um, in, insofar as that they, they must plead facts that their claims are typical or similar to other aggrieved employees. And at least one state and federal court have dismissed cases where plaintiffs have not pled facts to show that their experiences were similar to the other employees. Um, but I see this issue uh, coming into play more with respect to individual PAGA claims um, and whether such a thing even exists and in manageability, uh, which uh, I believe George is gonna touch on later today. So uh, what, are, what does a defendant do when uh, the PAGA letter or the PAGA pleading is insufficient and doesn't have these three elements? Well, I think the best practice is to uh, move to dismiss or move to strike the, the PAGA pleading. Um, you can seek, if the, if the PAGA letter is not attached as an exhibit to the complaint, uh, you can request judicial notice and bring in the PAGA letter so that the court has the PAGA letter and making its determination as to whether the claims were properly exhausted. Um, and uh, I, I think particularly with failure to exhaust is something I would raise early and I would also include it as an affirmative defense. Next slide, please. So um, turning to the issue of uh, statute of limitations, uh, it's settled law that a uh, PAGA claim is controlled by the one-year statute of limitations for penalty claims set forth in Code of Civil Procedure Section 340. Um, the st that statute of limitations, however, is told once the plaintiff submits notice of the purported labor code violations to the LWDA and the employer. Uh, for labor code violations, uh, I'm sorry, for labor code sections identified in Labor Code Section 2699.5, which is most of them, as George noted, the statute of limitations is told for 65 days. But for Labor Code Sections not identified in Labor Code Section 2699.5, the statute of limitations is only told for 33 days. And during this tolling period, uh, which parallels the LWDA's 
review period or whatever they're doing during that time, a plaintiff cannot file a civil lawsuit. Uh, it's important to note that a uh, deficient LWDA notice will not toll the statute of limitations for 65 days. Um, and this was an issue in Brown versus Ralph's grocery store. Uh, there, the plaintiff's PAGA notice did not exhaust the claims alleged in the complaint. And by the time the plaintiff had filed an amended PAGA notice, the statute of limitations had lapsed. So unfortunately for this plaintiff, they didn't get the benefit of the 65 days of tolling. Uh, there is also um, an additional tolling element to monitor that is unique to this COVID-19 era that we're all living in right now. And that is emergency rule nine. Emergency rule nine told for approximately six months the statute of limitations of any cause of action that had a statute of limitations of at least 180 days. The broad definition of emergency rule nine arguably includes PAGA claims, but it's unclear whether emergency rule nine will apply to PAGA claims, which are essentially the state's claims until exhaustion. Uh, and it's also unclear how emergency rule nine will apply or impact the exhaustion requirement, if at all. Um, I anticipate seeing some, some challenges to emergency rule nine over the next year. I don't know if they'll relate to PAGA, but I think on constitutional grounds, uh, we might see those popping up. Uh, setting aside emergency rule nine for now, uh, there are two limitations periods to keep in mind when defending or bringing a PAGA lawsuit. Uh, the first is that the, the claims need to be exhausted with the LWDA within one year of their accrual. And the second limitations period is that the PAGA civil lawsuit must be filed within one year and 65 days or one year and 63 days, or 33 days, I'm sorry, uh, after the claims accrue, depending on uh, the violation at issue. So um, what does it mean for the claims to accrue um, and how do we measure that? Well, um, the claims accrue uh, once the violation occurs and the uh, Northern District in California, Northern District of California in Brown versus Dow Chemical uh, reaffirmed this understanding. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff sought PAGA penalties for a violation of Labor Code Section 432.5 which prohibits an employer from requiring an employee to enter into a written agreement that is prohibited by law. The court held that the violation of Labor Code Section 432.5 accrued when the plaintiff signed the agreement that allegedly violated the law. Therefore, the plaintiff had one year from the date he or she signed the agreement to bring her PAGA lawsuit. Um, so often I'll, I'll see PAGA claims that allege a violation of Labor Code Section 432.5 but the signing of that agreement occurred at onboarding. And it's been years since the plaintiff uh, was employed by the employer. And therefore that claim, while it, while it may have existed accrued when the employer came on board, it is outside the statute of limitations when the plaintiff turns around and sues the employer. Uh, these time periods are important to keep in mind for discovery and damages assessments as well. Um, for those of you representing defense counsel, you should seek to limit all discovery to one year and 65 days prior to the filing of the PAGA complaint. And when calculating exposure, it's important to keep in mind that the plaintiff cannot recover any civil penalties beyond the one year and 65 days prior to the filing of the complaint. Uh, courts have allowed and are allowing the use of the relation back doctrine to relate a later filed PAGA claim to an earlier filing. But courts have held that the relation back doctrine cannot be used to frustrate the legislator's intent that a party exhaust their claims with the LWDA within the statute of limitations period. So in other words, relation back cannot be used and is not available to a plaintiff who did not timely exhaust their PAGA claims. Also, a PAGA claim can only relate back to the filing of the PAGA notice. So a plaintiff can't use relation back to uh, seek penalties beyond the one year statute of limitations period. And uh, more frequently, we are seeing uh, 
employ employees amending their PAGA notices to add more allegations. Uh, and at least one California appellate court in Brown versus Ralph's Grocery suggested that if the amended LWDA notice arises out of the same facts as the original LWDA notice, the later filed administrative filing can relate back. So um, next slide, please. Now on to uh, who has standing to bring a PAGA claim. To bring a PAGA claim, a plaintiff must be an aggrieved current or former employee, meaning that the plaintiff must have suffered the labor code violation at issue in the complaint. Uh, the California Appellate Court clarified that the plaintiff does not need to have suffered all labor code violations she alleges, but must suffer at least one violation in the complaint. Uh, and the seminal case on point here is Huff versus Securitas. There, the plaintiff sought PAGA penalties for a violation of labor code section 201.3, which only applies to temporary services employees uh, and labor code sections 201 and 202. The court ruled that even though the plaintiff was not aggrieved as to labor code section 201.3 because uh, he was not a temporary services employee, he could still seek PAGA penalties for that violation on behalf of other aggrieved employees. The, court's reason, the court reasoned that because the plaintiff had suffered a violation, uh, and here the violation was related to a violation of section 201, he was aggrieved. Uh, as defense counsel, I would argue that Huff was a special case and its application should be limited to 201.3 and 201 and 202 because all of these statutes deal with pay frequency. Um, unfortunately, I've seen uh, Huff be expanded um, far beyond that application uh, and sort of open the door uh, for uh, very large PAGA actions. Uh, how do we know if an employee is not agreed with this? pretty straightforward. If the employee didn't suffer any labor code violation, then they are not aggrieved. Um, and essentially, this is one mechanism to attack pocket claims after the uh, pleading stage, and that's on summary judgment. And that's to establish at summary judgment that the aggrieved, the purported aggrieved employer, the plaintiff here, didn't suffer a single labor code violation. Um, also, up until last year, uh, we understood that a plaintiff is no longer aggrieved if she settled the underlying labor code violations. But according to the California Supreme Court, an employee does not need to have an unresolved injury in order to have standing to serve as a PAGA representative. Uh, and the seminal case here is Kim v. Raines, uh, which uh, was issued last year. And in Kim, the plaintiff brought suit against her employer alleging that he was a misclassified employee. Uh, I'm sorry, against his employer alleging that he was a misclassified employee. And the plaintiff filed his complaint as a class action, but also included a cause of action under PAGA. The employer successfully moved uh, to compel the individual claims to arbitration uh, and the PAGA claim was stayed. Uh, and once in arbitration, the party settled all of the plaintiff's individual claims, but specifically carved out the pending PAGA, allegate, uh, PAGA action. At the conclusion of the arbitration, the employer filed a motion for summary judgment in the PAGA action, arguing that the plaintiff was no longer an aggrieved employee and had no standing to serve as the PAGA representative. Uh, the Supreme Court disagreed and uh, based on PAGA statutory language and the purpose of protecting employees, concluded that an employee does not need to have an unresolved injury in order to serve as the PAGA representative. Instead, an aggrieved employee retains standing to sue uh, as long as they have allegedly suffered a relevant labor code violation. And settling a claim for such a violation does not make the employee any less aggrieved. The Supreme Court did not address what happens when an employee settles her po own PAGA claim, uh, because in the Kim case, the PAGA claim was, ex was expressly excluded from the settlement. So it remains unresolved whether a plaintiff would be precluded from bringing a representative PAGA claim if that PAGA plaintiff had previously settled 
his PAGA claim along with his other individual labor code claims. And adding a little bit more confusion to this, it's further unclear what would happen if a PAGA plaintiff or a would-be PAGA plaintiff settles his PAGA claim uh, before even exhausting with the LWDA. Um, but that's the basics of who can bring a PAGA claim and what it means to allege a PAGA claim. And I'll turn it back to George uh, to discuss whether a PAGA claim can be removed to federal court. Thanks, Chris. And before we get to that, we've got a few questions I think we probably should try to, to tackle now while, while we're on the subjects that you've been discussing. And with regard to the settlement issue that you just alluded to, we did have a question about settlements and, and we will talk about settlements toward the end. So I'll save that question uh, for later. Um, but we had a couple of questions with regard to the, the timing um, issues that you've been discussing. And actually one that, that talked about the uh, two that have just inquired about the exhaustion issue. So there was one question that whether the trend um, in the law was was contra to the Ninth Circuit case that uh, that I cited earlier, the Alcantar case, um, and, and wondered whether courts were not inclined to dismiss a case for failure to comply with administrative remedies. And and there certainly are several of those that that um, have concluded that the uh, exhaustion letter is sufficiently uh, does sufficiently state the facts and theories but there are some uh, that, that have concluded they're not and it's just it, and in part I think that I wouldn't know that I would call it a trend in the law but I think it's just been a, um, a better effort on the behalf of, of plaintiffs lawyers to better state the facts and theories in letters uh, over time so I think that's been when one aspect of, of the exhaustion issue um, Another question we had on, on exhaustion was, is it better to attack the LWDA exhaustion as a motion for judgment on the pleadings later on um, so that the plaintiff doesn't amend the letter within the statute of limitations? And that's certainly uh, a legitimate approach and, and one that, uh, that we've seen to be successful. So that may be strategically one that, uh, that you want to, to tackle. Um, Chris, one of, the, one of the questions had to do with um, the timing issue. Um, and the question was, what happens if you file uh, your complaint before waiting the full number of days uh, after sending the letter to the LWDA? Um, and can you, can you cure this, what they call a technical issue, for example, by um, you know, where you file um, a week early? And you know, I'd be interested in your experience in that. I've seen courts that have uh, essentially allowed dismiss the claim with leave to amend and then the the amendment is is stated saying that they've sufficiently uh, exhausted the time frame but I don't know if your experience has been different same so uh, there are definitely courts that would dismiss the claim and permit leave to amend presuming that it's still timely um, and there are I've seen others where the matter just continues if it's a few days early uh, we just limit the period of time that the PAGA civil penalties could be recovered for, and, and we continue. I, I think the only time this would really raise a problem is if you're filing early to squeeze in a claim that would otherwise be barred by the statute of limitations. I think that's right. And, and another question is somewhat related to that is, what if during discovery, uh, a plaintiff discovers a violation that was not pleaded and was not contained in the original letter to the Labor Department? Um, does the plaintiff have to essentially start over with a new letter and a new complaint, or is there some mechanism for trying to wrap that subsequently found violation into the original complaint? If here, I think if the original letter was broad enough to cover the subsequently discovered violations, uh, I would, I would seek to amend or file an amended PAGA notice, which you can do on the PAGA website now, um, and seek to relate that back to the original letter. Uh, however, if the original letter was very narrowly tailored to, for example, it only had pay stub claims and you just discovered a meal period claim, uh, you're gonna have to file a new letter in that case. Um, and with respect to whether or not you need to file a new complaint, I think you could likely amend your complaint, but your two claims may have different statute limitations. And what about a deadline for amending the LWDA letter itself? Is there is there any stated um, deadline for, for amending your letter? 
I haven't seen one, but in Brown versus Ralph's, I think their amendment was, I want to say it was over a year later or maybe even longer than that. And the court said that as long as it arose out of the same facts and theories, essentially, if you've given everybody enough notice, uh, it, it's going to be, it, it's probably going to be permissible. Yeah, I mean, I think the relate the typical relation back uh, analysis of whether it's the same facts and theories is, is going to be uh, critical to trying to uh, either amend or, or wrap in a new a new claim. Well, let's move into the the next slide. Then um, Chris mentioned that we were going to talk about federal jurisdiction, and um, employers uh, are always um, anxious to get claims into federal court, and so. Um, there, there have been a couple of mechanisms for, for doing that, um, and let's talk about, about, talk about what those are. What, uh, we're going to talk about the Class Action Fairness Act, uh, and we're also going to talk about traditional diversity, um, two ways that employers will often seek to get um, claims into, into federal court. So when, you bring a, when, when a plaintiff brings a PAGA action, um, at the beginning when PAGA was first um, uh, first available to, to plaintiffs, they were often brought as class actions. Um, and bringing a POGA claim can be brought in one of two ways. You can bring it as a class action, um, or in addition to a class action, or you can bring it as a standalone claim under, under POGA. And that distinction makes a difference um, if, if, you, if, if an employer is trying to remove a case to federal court. So under the Class Action Fairness Act, as we all may remember, there's a uh, one of the obligations that the employer has to demonstrate is that there's more than $5 million uh, in controversy. And if a, if a PAGA claim um, is asserted as, as a representative action only, so it's a PAGA-only claim, courts have found that there is no removal under the Class Action Fairness Act, because it's not a class action. It's a PAGA representative action. And so the Class Action Fairness Act doesn't apply in those circumstances. If it is a class action or coupled with the class action, then CAFA jurisdiction may be possible. Um, and as long as you can establish the 5 million in controversy. And so the two cases that really discuss those issues in depth are the Yocopicio case and the Bauman case, both out of the Ninth Circuit. Um, which are which are um, listed on your screen there. Now, if we could go to the next slide, please. We'll talk about what what if it is um, asserted as a class action or, or coupled with a class action. So you've got the potential for CAFA jurisdiction now, and so one of the uh, items that you need to establish as as an employer seeking to remove a case is that there's more than five million dollars in controversy. And so the issue becomes, well, what, what can you count toward that $5 million? You may have the underlying um, damages, the, the, the failure to pay overtime, for example, or uh, any of the underlying you know, wage issues. But the question often says, what about the penalties um, that are available under PAGA? Can you count those toward the, um, toward the amount necessary to establish the, the $5 million? Um, and there are cases that go uh, across the board on this issue. Um, there are some that say you can ensure that you know, PAGA is the, 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 all the penalties that are available under PAGA count towards the amount of controversy. So you include the entire 100%. Um, there are others that say no, the 75% the of those penalties go to the state. And so the only uh, amount that's in, in play is what the, is the 25 percent that goes to the aggrieved employees and so those are what should be counted toward the the five million dollars there are other cases that even go further than that and say you really only should look at the individual plaintiffs penalties uh, the 25 percent of the, the that will go to the individual penalty uh, the individual plaintiff and so now you're uh, really kind of winnowing down the uh, the amount that you might count towards the controversy and then there are some that say uh, you don't include any PAGA penalties at all. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a range of cases on this issue. So if this is an issue that you're focused on, uh, you'll want to, uh, to look for the cases that, that support your, your position and, and argue that those are, are the more applicable cases. Um, my own personal view is the, uh, the amount in controversy is whatever the defendant's going to pay if it loses. Um, so in my view, it shouldn't matter who it gets paid to, but um, 
I am not on, on any court that can uh, establish that rule. So my view is, uh, is, is, is remains only my view. Um, let's talk about traditional diversity. If we could go to the next slide, please. So employers may also try to uh, establish that the individual uh, plaintiff's claim is worth more than the $75,000 required to establish traditional diversity. Um, and there was some uh, debate uh, up until several years ago um, that you should be able to aggregate the penalties uh, uh, for all of the aggrieved employees. Since it was a representative action, uh, employers argued you should focus on the penalties that are available to all the aggrieved employees. And the Urbino case cited on your slide there uh, has said that that is not the case. You cannot aggregate uh, penalties to get to the 75,000 uh, in individual diversity, which um, in my view, and, and we'll talk about this later, but that suggests that a pocket claim uh, arguably is an individual type of claim, which you'll see in a later discussion, other courts have, have said is not the case. Um, so even if you can't aggregate the penalties available to everybody, again, you, you're faced with the issue of, well, is it 25% that goes to the uh, the individual plaintiff, or or can you uh, use the whole hundred percent of the penalties, seventy five percent of which would go to um, the, the the state? And I think the uh, many cases are again focusing on just the individual plaintiffs that uh, share of the award. So just the twenty five percent would be uh, the likely um, ones to be counted. Now, one of the issues that comes up too is is calculating. PAGA penalties for, for removal purposes. Um, how many penalties can, can you include? Um, and this is where it's going to be important to focus on um, the language of the complaint. It's gonna be uh, the defendant's obligation uh, in establishing to the court that they've met the threshold um, for, for the dollar amount to get into federal court there has to be reasonable assumptions uh, in, in calculating the amount. Well, we're going to calculate that, you know, that there were, you know, one PAGA penalty per pay period over a certain time frame, And when you do the math, you get to the proper, um, the proper th dollar threshold. But you've, as a defendant trying to remove a case, you're going to need to establish reasonable assumptions for the number of penalties um, that you're proposing be included in the calculation. Is it, is it reasonable to include a, a PAGA penalty for every pay period? And it's often going to be important to focus on the language of the complaint. And many complaints are phrased in a way such that the allegation is that there was a violation every pay period. Nobody ever got a meal period. Nobody ever got a rest break. Uh, every every day there was, a, there was a violation. And so defendants will will use that language to establish that the, based on the complaint, they're seeking a, a large number of, of penalties and, and can use that to their advantage to establish the underlying claim. Um, if it's a, a PAGA only claim, so CAFA jurisdiction, CAFA jurisdiction is not available. You only have traditional diversity as an avenue. Uh, you're only gonna be able to include the civil penalties um, not any of the underlying statutory penalties or damages that might be associated with the underlying violation. So if we go to the next slide. We're going to take a turn and talk about a little bit about what a um, what what the nature of a representative action is. So um, PAGA is the, the the way PAGA is established. It is a it is a representative action, not a class action. And so there have been uh, debates about whether the rule 23 or class action rules uh, apply. And the courts have said um, that in, in state court, uh, you do not have to comply with any of the class action allegations that was established many years ago by the California Supreme Court. And so the issue really was uh, brought down to federal court and does the rule 23 apply? Uh, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, for, for many years, some cases said, yes, Rule 23 does apply, with the rationale being that PAGA is just a procedural statute. It doesn't, uh, it's not a substantive statute. And when you have procedural limitations, Rule 23 supersedes any state procedural limitations on class actions. And so there were many 
federal courts that did require plaintiffs to meet the Rule 23 uh, standards for establishing a class action, even though it was a representative action. Others, other cases said, no, that's not right. Um, PAGA does provide some substantive rights, and so it's not just a procedural statute. All of that was laid to rest um, this, this past year by the Canala versus Costco wholesale case out of the Ninth Circuit, which said that Rule 23 does not apply. And so we now have a, uh, uh, a rationale or, or a clear just direction from the Ninth Circuit that Rule 23 uh, does not apply. So um, employers will, will, have, uh, for, will have to forego that argument by and large. Um, let's turn next to uh, what kind of proof we need. And this is on the next slide. Um, it is a representative action. And so what kind of proof do you need to uh, establish your, your claim? Um, Chris mentioned that you do need to show that each uh, represented employee is, is an aggrieved employee, but how you do that um, continues to be litigated. And, and there's been attempts to do that through sampling. There's attempts to do that through surveys uh, and courts uh, address those, those types of proof in, in many different contexts. And I think the, the uh, analyses from those contexts will spill over into whether you can use them to establish a claim in um, in a representative PAGA action as well, and I think the uh, the issues will also depend on the underlying uh, statutory violation. If your underlying statutory violation is a is a wage statement, um, it may be pretty uh, uh, fairly simple for uh, a plaintiff to establish that the in, that all the aggrieved employees received the same wage statement and, and had the same error on that wage statement. And so that may be something that's easier to uh, establish than if there are individual questions regarding uh, meal periods, for example. So it may depend on the underlying type of claim as well as to what your proof should be. Um, and that goes to the issue of manageability as well. One of the, as we all know, one of the, one of the key criteria for uh, a class action is to enable, to establish that, that a trial would be manageable. Um, and some class actions have, class certification has been denied because of a failure to show that, uh, that a trial, the trial would be manageable. Um, and some courts have, have adopted or carried that over to representative actions and have said that you, you need to show manageability here as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's an issue that, that, again, cases go both ways on. Uh, the, the Daly versus Sears Roebuck case that we uh, included on our list is one that employers will point to uh, to show that manageability uh, is something that a plaintiff needs to be able to demonstrate in, in order for the representative action to proceed. And there's also uh, employers point to the, the Williams v. Superior Court uh, case that was came down by the California Supreme Court um, back in 2017. And it talks about, it may be considered dicta by some, but it, it talks about a uniform policy being one way to render trial of the action manageable. So there is a reference by the California Supreme Court to the need for or the aspect of manageability uh, in, a, in a pocket claim. And so employers will, will point to that as well. And so that is going to be one issue that we expect to be uh, that we expect to see litigated uh, over the next several years as to whether an individual a representative action has been shown to be manageable uh, at trial. Um, another question that comes up is um, the, the ability for an individual to bring an individual pack class action, or I'm sorry, an individual PAGA action. Uh, the courts have addressed this issue uh, on several occasions, and it really stems from the language of the statute itself. And the language of the statute says that an aggrieved employee can, can bring a lawsuit on behalf of himself or herself and others. It doesn't say or others, it says and others. And so most cases have said that uh, there is no such thing as an individual PAGA action. It has to be a representative claim uh, on behalf of, of all aggrieved employees and on behalf of the state of California. And so that really impacts whether there's an opportunity to settle. For example, that Chris alluded to earlier, um, can an individual settle their, their own PAGA action or is there such a thing as one's own PAGA action? 
uh, the Urbino and the Bauman case that I mentioned earlier in the context of removal seem to be, in my view, at odds with this conclusion that a PAGA claim has to be representative because they held that um, the, the, it's an individual, only individual penalties could be considered and you couldn't uh, aggregate them. So that suggested to me that the, that the PAGA, that they, those courts viewed PAGA as more of an individual action, but the, the, the courts by and large have, say, have said that it's not, uh, not, there's no such thing as an individual PAGA action. With regard to uh, the penalties, we've, we've already talked about that the statute sets out um, the, the plain language that the 75% uh, goes to the state, 25% um, goes to the aggrieved employees. There have been a couple of cases, not many, but a couple of cases that have said um, that the individual who brought the action gets the full 25%. Um, but that, that has seemed to have fallen by the wayside and the actual um, conclusion of courts now is that that 25% is to be distributed um, to all employees, uh, all, all of the aggrieved employees. And so that, that, that seems to be where courts have, have landed on that issue. Um, one of the key factors with regard to penalties under PAGA is that the amount of penalties uh, is within the court's discretion. And that is a factor that comes up um, not only at trial, um, but also for potential settlement. Um, obviously, when a plaintiff lays out the, the potential value of the claim for a mediator, um, they're going to um, do the math in, in a way that, that uh, counts full amount of penalties. And the defendants will respond and say, well, that's sure, soaking wet, that may be what it's worth, but there's no court that's gonna award the full amount of, of penalties. Um, and so that's a key uh, aspect for defense counsel when you're at a mediation is to really focus on, is a court likely to uh, award the full amount of penalties? And there are cases that discuss uh, the amount of PAGA penalties that should be awarded in light of the other circumstances. And there are numerous factors that the courts consider. Um, did the employer try to do the right thing and just make a, a technical error? Um, did they correct it once they were alerted to it? Um, you know, did they, do they, are they taking any steps to, to fix the problem? And so all of those, and what, what's, what is the amount of the underlying uh, statutory penalties, if any, or the underlying damages, if any. Um, and, and some courts will consider those in determining whether the full amount of the PAGA penalties um, uh, will be awarded. And so as defense counsel, we often uh, argue that um, even if there are going to be PAGA penalties, no court would ever award the full amount. And so you should discount those in, in considering what the value of the case is. Another issue with regard to penalties is the, the uh, concept of initial versus subsequent violations. So the, the language of the statute says that there's a $100 penalty for the initial violation and $200 penalty for the subs any subsequent violation. And so a debate among plaintiffs and defense counsel for years has been, well, the, the first pay period, plaintiffs will argue, is the initial violation and every period after that is a subsequent violation. And defense counsel responded, no, all of them are initial violations until, until we're told, uh, until the employer is told that there has been a violation. And then if they repeat it again, then it would be a subsequent violation. And um, just recently in, in the, uh, just last month in February, uh, there was a Ninth Circuit decision called Bernstein versus Virgin America, uh, which we listed in the, in the list of cases that we provided to you. Um, which held that um, the defense counsel had the better argument on that issue, that uh, the, until an employer is told uh, either by the labor commissioner or by a judgment that they've violated the labor code, they're all initial, uh, they should be measured at the initial violation um, number. And um, the, 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 the Ninth Circuit has concluded that that, that is um, the better read on that. There was a debate even uh, before this case that, well, if the employer is told by way of a complaint that they're violating uh, a labor code statute, then that should trigger the subsequent violation 
the higher amount. Uh, and, and this Bernstein case uh, says that that, that that is not the proper, the better analysis. The better analysis is whether either the labor commissioner or a judgment has told the employer um, that, that there's been a, an initial violation. Um, we're going to turn next, we'll, we'll see if there's some questions to answer, but we're going to turn next to the issue of, of discovery and arbitration, which are two uh, heavily litigated areas as well. But um, Chris, if there have been any questions on this, uh, these fronts, let's go through those. Yeah, this is a hot topic, George. We've got a number of questions about manageability, uh, and I tried to answer a few of them uh, by text, but um, the first uh, asks for are there any cases regarding manageability that are good for plaintiffs, uh, i.e. That state, plain, that state manageability is not part of the analysis? And I'm not aware of any case right now that goes as far as to say that manageability is never part of the analysis, but there are cases uh, that state that manageability is not, shouldn't come up until after discovery or it's not a part of the pleading stage. Um, and the most recent one I can think of is Castro v. PPG Industries, and that's a case out of the Central District. It was decided uh, in January 2021. Yeah, you're right. Um, the, and, and I think it, the a lot of the cases discuss, discussing manageability discuss it, as you said, whether uh, whether it's appropriate to can make it, reach any conclusion at all at the, at the pleading stage or whether it should be decided later. And, and I think the courts are typically clear that you know we're gonna we're gonna hold off on discussing this un until until later, um, and so that that's that's the primary area where they do come up. I, I think there's also there's a Silver versus Domino's Pizza case, um, which I think um, talked about um, refusing to impose a manageability requirement. That's the only only one that I'm aware of that uh, that may be that uh, explicit on it, and um, and. That was a Central District of California case. And so I think what you're gonna find is that there are cases oftentimes decided in the district court level that, that kind of go both ways on the issue. Uh, there was a question about uh, any state court cases that have dealt with manageability. And uh, there is a Daly versus Sears. And in that case, the court said uh, denied uh, this classification because it would be unmanageable and uh, said that the Pago representative status may also be denied for that same reason. And that's once that's a state court case. that's a little older. It's from 2013. Um, but it's, it's published and it's the only one that I'm aware of where a state court specifically got into manageability. Yeah, that's, and that's, that, that was listed in, in the, um, in the, list of cases that we provided, because that is one that uh, defendants will often point to as um, holding that manageability is something that needs to be demonstrated and, and the failure to demonstrate it can result in the denial of representative status. Uh, and George's question was for you, uh, clarification on what it means to plead a PAGA claim as a class action rather than file together with a class action. I think probably together with a class action is, is probably the better phrasing on that. I think courts have, have talked about it being filed as a class action, um, but I think the, 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 the more typical, what I've seen, the more typical way that plaintiffs bring these cases is, is coupling them with class action. So they have a class action allegation for the underlying wage violations and then a PAGA claim on, on top of that. And another interesting one, George, uh, the stacking of penalties. Could you speak to that? Sure. I mean, that's that's an issue that continues to be litigated, and whether um, you know you a plaintiff can recover PAGA penalties for um, multiple you know, different individual PAGA penalties for different violations of, of the labor code. And so, if you've got a the meal period violation, can you get a PAGA penalty for that? And if you've got a rest period, can you can you bring a uh, uh, get a PAGA penalty for that? Um, I think that's an issue that's going to be continue to be litigated. I don't think there's a definitive answer one way or the other. I think, again, what it'll come down to in many instances is the court, the court's discretion to award PAGA penalties and, and Will they determine that it's unreasonable or arbitrary and capricious to, to stack penalties in that regard? 
Great. Thank you, George. Uh, there are some other questions, but I, I, I'm going to touch on a few of these in the next slides and whatever's left over. And if we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle those at the end. Terrific. So there used to be a lot more to say about PAGA discovery, uh, but in 2017, the California Supreme Court issued their opinion in Williams v. Superior Court and basically put an end to that discussion, at least at the high court level. Uh, in Williams, the plaintiff issued special interrogatories requesting the contact information for about 16,000 employees. Uh, Marshalls, the defendant in that case, objected, say, uh, claiming that the request was overbroad and unduly burdensome um, because, specifically, because the plaintiff had not yet established that the employees were aggrieved. The trial court agreed with Marshall, uh, Marshalls that uh, the discovery should at least initially be limited to only the store that the plaintiff worked at until there is some type of threshold showing that the plaintiff was aggrieved. Um, and the plaintiff ultimately sought Supreme Court review. And the Supreme Court ruled that a PAGA plaintiff's right to discovery is broad and that a plaintiff does not need to prove or establish as a prerequisite to seeking contact information that the other employees are aggrieved. Uh, Marshalls maintained that it violated the, its employees' rights of privacy uh, to disclose the contact information and the Supreme Court again disagreed, stating that um, any privacy interests in contact information could be protected through the issuance of a Bell Air West notice. Now, Williams versus Superior Court is not all bad news for employers. The Williams case does recognize that in particular cases, there may be a special reason to limit or postpone a PAGA representative's access to contact information, but it did not specify what those special cases were. However, uh, one of the questions here uh, raised was about uh, independent contractors and who or when is that issue decided in a PAGA case. And I actually think that's an, uh, an, a, a good case study to use to try to limit Williams or at least uh, sequence discovery uh, to the extent Williams will permit it. So for example, if I was faced with a PAGA claim uh, brought by an independent contractor, which actually happens a lot in the entertainment context, um, I would try to limit initial discovery to the independent contractor issue. And because if the employer establishes that the plaintiff is truly an independent contractor, there is no basis for any PAGA claim. He can't be an aggrieved employee, and we know that we don't have to open up discovery beyond that issue. Um, and uh, I don't know if that would be successful, but it is something that I would definitely try to explore. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was another question about can an exempt employee bring a PAGA action? And yes, generally exempt employees can bring PAGA actions because exempt employees, for example, are owed reimbursements for the use of their personal equipment and the discharge of their duties. Um, so, and if they're not reimbursed, then they can bring a PAGA claim. But exempt employees can also bring PAGA claims to the extent that they allege they were misclassified. But again, if, if I'm faced with a misclassification PAGA claim, I would try to sequence the discovery so I can tackle that misclassification issue first. Because if I've established that this person is correctly classified as exempt, then the PAGA claim basically is moot. Um, and I'm not aware of any cases that have done this yet, but that's sort of my thinking on how I would approach it. Um, there are two unpublished decisions that do touch on limitations to Williams. Um, and the first is Harris versus Best Buy. And in that case, the, uh, the plaintiff requested contact information for all of Best Buy's employees across California. And uh, the court limited the request to 500 randomly selected employees and noting at this juncture that the sampling was more appropriate. Uh, it's important to note that in, in this case, unlike Williams, the defendant offered a sampling. So in Williams, if they offered a sampling, who knows how that case would have turned out, um, but here they offered a sampling. And in addition, it, this case was in its very early stages of discovery, so the, the court felt that if there was gonna be opening up broad discovery, it could do so at a later time. 
And another decision, um, again, out of federal court is Goro versus Flower Foods. And in Goro, the court um, required that the contact information that the plaintiff was seeking be relevant to the case um, because the FRCP, uh, the federal rules of civil procedure have a relevancy requirement. And for that reason, the court limited the contact information to a specific subsidiary of the defendant. And despite all this, employers still aren't left without recourse. Uh, unlike class actions, PAGA doesn't create any type of attorney-client relationship between the putative aggrieved employees and the uh, plaintiff's attorney. So a practice tip to employers is to begin an investigation early and immediately begin speaking to the allegedly aggrieved employees and do so before you're required or ordered to produce the contact information. Um, let's uh, go on to the next slide, which is uh, about arbitration. In 2014, the California Supreme Court decided uh, Iskanian, and in that case, they held that pre-dispute arbitration agreements cannot be used to waive a plaintiff's right to bring a PAGA representative action. Uh, and the court reasoned that a PAGA claim lies outside of the Federal Arbitration Act's coverage because it is not a dispute between the employer and an employee, but rather it's a dispute between the employer and the state. Um, since Iskanian, courts have interpreted that case to foreclose the enforcement of an arbitration agreement seeking to compel arbitration of a PAGA claim. So uh, for example, in Castro, the Pinnacle Plastering Co., uh, the defendant tried to compel the arbitration of a PAGA case um, and the court denied the motion um, stating that pre-dispute arbitration agreements cannot be enforced to the extent there, they seek to compel arbitration of a PAGA case. Uh, Iskanian has withheld, uh, withstood a number of attacks, uh, particularly following the Supreme Court's decision in Epic Systems, the United States Supreme Court decision in Epic Systems. Uh, most recently in uh, a case uh, called Correa, Correa versus N.B. Baker, um, the defendant argued that Iskanian is no longer binding because it's inconsistent with Epic Systems. And uh, the California Appellate Court found that Epic Systems did not address claims for civil penalties brought on behalf of the government. And therefore, the Iskanian ruling on this nar narrow issue was still binding. And several other California Appellate Courts have come to a similar conclusion. Iskanian did leave open uh, whether post-dispute arbitration agreements can waive a PAGA claim. Um, and Julian versus Glenair, it answered part of that question. Um, there, the plaintiff uh, entered into an arbitration agreement after the filing of an earlier PAGA lawsuit. And the arbitration agreement in question specifically referenced the earlier filed PAGA lawsuit. Uh, but nonetheless, the employee turned around and still filed her own PAGA action and the employer moved to compel. Uh, the court found that the arbitration agreement in question was still a pre-dispute ar arbitration agreement, holding that any arbitration agreement entered into prior to exhaustion is a pre-dispute arbitration agreement. So uh, Julian, uh, reinforces that in state court, it's going to be very difficult to compel arbitration of a PAGA claim. The door remains open, uh, I suppose, for an employee to agree to arbitrate a PAGA claim after exhaustion, uh, but it's unlikely that an employee who's represented by counsel would agree to that. Uh, and I don't necessarily see the benefit to an employer to have a, a big, massive PAGA action pending an arbitration where there really is no right to appeal. As for federal court, they've largely followed suit here. Um, the Ninth Circuit and Sakab uh, followed Iskanian and held that a pre-dispute arbitration agreement to waive an employee's right to bring a PAGA action is unenforceable. Uh, most recently, the Ninth Circuit rejected an argument that Epic effectively overrules Sakab, and that case was Rivas versus Coverall, decided on uh, in January 2021. 
And while the Ninth Circuit may not permit the waiving of a PAGA claim through an arbitration agreement, they have permitted plaintiffs uh, PAGA claims to be compelled to arbitration pursuant to a valid arbitration agreement. Um, although I haven't seen that done recently, it has been successful in the past. So um, how do courts treat arbitration agreements that have both uh, a, a waiver or an unenforceable provision with respect to a PAGA claim? Well, the Ninth Circuit addressed this issue in Poublon versus C.H. Robinson Co. And there they basically held that the PAGA waiver can be severed from an otherwise valid arbitration agreement. And the district courts and California courts have largely followed this holding. Uh, next slide, please. So last time we were here, we presented, uh, or that, like the hot topic of that time was whether the wage portion of a PAGA claim seeking penalties for a violation of Labor Code Section 558 was subject to arbitration. Labor Code Section 558 provides a civil penalty for unpaid wages and in addition provides that the labor commissioner can recover the amount of unpaid wages as a civil penalty. Uh, the California Court of Appeal had consistently held that the underpaid wages portion of a 558 claim uh, was recoverable as a civil penalty under PAGA. And in fact, many PAGA settlements uh, up until last year had a carve out for wages and wages were distributed as part of the deal. Um, but the courts were split, however, on whether or not this wage element needed to be arbitrated or if it could, or if, or if it was not subject to a mandatory arbitration agreement. And uh, in 2020, the California Supreme Court weighed in and provided some much needed guidance on this issue. In ZBNA versus Superior Court, the question presented to the court was whether the wage portion of the 558 penalty needed to be arbitrated. And the Supreme Court went beyond the question presented and stated that it's clear that the unpaid wages the Labor Commissioner recovers through Section 558 are separate from and in addition to, rather than included within the civil penalty a private plaintiff may recover in a PAGA action. Therefore, PAGA plaintiffs now may not recover underpaid wages uh, under Section 558 in any form. Uh, rather, a claim for wages and a claim for wages is a private dispute between an employer and an employee. It's going to have to play out in arbitration. Or in, or in state court or in front of the labor commissioner. Um, we often see cases alleging both individual claims and PAGA claims. Uh, where, the, where there is an arbitration agreement, uh, defense counsel will typically move to compel the individual claims to arbitration. And they will also seek to stay the PAGA case pending the individual case in arbitration. Uh, the reason for the stay is to avoid, you know, duplicative litigation and uh, unnecessary expense. And also, if the plaintiff can't prevail in arbitration, then he or she is not aggrieved and has no standing to bring a PAGA claim. Most courts are receptive to this approach, but there are some courts now uh, that are requiring the parties to proceed in tandem, both with the PAGA claim and the civil uh, and the arbitration uh, at the same time. So. Um, my recommendation to defense counsel is research your assigned judge before seeking to compel uh, an individual case to arbitration while staying a pocket case, because you may end up litigating uh, two actions at the same time. Um, given all these uncertainties about pocket claims, it's no surprise that many of these parties settle. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to George to talk about settlement. Thanks, Chris. Then, yes, settlement is always a, a hot topic. And um, there, we have several questions on it that I see that, that I'll try and weave into the discussion here. So um, historically in class actions, um, when, when, when um, PAGA was first uh, on the scene, a lot of times there was a very small allocation made to the LWDA. So again, 75% goes to the LWDA for a PAGA claim, 25% goes to the aggrieved employees. When PAGA was first introduced, it was often coupled with a class action, and ultimately the, the LWDA typically got 
pretty short shrift uh, and courts would approve the settlements nonetheless and, and just allocate most of it toward the, the class action damages. Um, recently, that's been changing and courts have been focused a little bit more on uh, the, the existence of a PAGA claim and, and not uh, shortchanging the LWDA. And courts have been uh, requiring when a settlement is brought before it to uh, have the parties demonstrate why did you pick this number uh, as the number you're going to allocate to the PAGA claim. Um, and so one piece of advice for, for both sides uh, and for mediators is to make sure that the parties can uh, ha did explain to a judge why the, the PAGA claim is worth that particular amount uh, and, and how they justify that in terms of the overall value of the settlement. Um, with regard to uh, bringing a PAGA only claim, that, that is a, a, in somewhat recent years, a, a major um, strategy decision that a plaintiff may make is, is they're gonna bring it only as a PAGA only claim. To settle a PAGA only claim, then the court's gonna wanna see that 75% of that is going to the LWDA. And so that raises the, the prospect of, well, can you just settle with an individual plaintiff? Um, and, and in the class action world, that was we refer to those as the pickup sticks type settlement where, where you, uh, you settle with individual plaintiffs for their particular claims and, and then they're no longer part of the class. Can you do that and, and get rid of a PAGA claim? I think it's more challenging, um, but it, it can be done. I think you can, um, I, I have seen cases where it's brought as a PAGA only claim um, but the plaintiff agrees to dismiss the PAGA claim and just settle uh, the underlying violation. And so um, that, that may be one strategy that some judges have, have approved and, and said that um, we're, we'll let you dismiss your PAGA claim. Uh, you may need to explain it to the judge as to why you believe the PAGA claim should be dismissed. Um, but I have seen cases where um, underlying settlements uh, take place uh, with, with in kind of almost disregarding the PAGA claim. Um, another issue that, that was raised in one of the questions has to do with a, uh, a carve out um, in, in the PAGA for the construction industry. And, and, and there is, a, as of January 1, 2019, uh, a carve out with regard to collective bargaining agreements in the construction industry. And so it, it has some specif specified um, parameters that need to be met, including that it expressly, the collective bargaining agreement expressly waives the requirements of PAGA uh, and provides for all of the same relief as well. Um, lastly, we're, we're kind of at the end of our appointed time, but I did wanna discuss two, two other issues that we frequently see. Um, that is uh, the appeal process. Um, we often see, um, in particular, when, when uh, PAGA claims were coupled with class actions, if there was a denial of class cert, the plaintiffs would want to um, appeal the denial of class cert and would argue that the death knell doctrine uh, applies. The death knell doctrine essentially says that if, if, you're, uh, if you're, your class has been uh, decertified or, or, or refused to be certified, um, is, does that essentially amount to killing the case because all that's left is an individual claim? Um, in those instances, the court would allow an appeal to go forward. However, courts have said that the death knell doctrine typically does not apply um, when there's a, an ongoing PAGA claim because the PAGA claim provides sufficient uh, justification for proceeding forward and, and waiting until that is decided before you appeal the underlying uh, denial of class certification. In some instances, um, a plaintiff may want to try to dismiss their own PAGA claim um, in order to get at the underlying class certification denial. Um, and, and there have not been a definitive ruling on that that I've seen. There was one court that um, noted it was an issue but decided to treat the, the appeal as a, as a writ and, and decided the issue in that fashion. Uh, and then lastly, since we're, we're at the end of the hour here, um, it has to do with the constitutionality of PAGA. This is an issue that employers have raised since 2004, probably, and have not been successful in, in challenging it yet. There have been many courts have said, including um, uh, the California Supreme Court, that have, have suggested that it is perfectly constitutional. Um, there is a... Uh, 
a new case that, that was filed in 2018, I believe, in Orange County Superior Court by the California Business and Industrial Alliance challenging the constitutionality of that. Um, that is, in my view, I guess, probably unlikely to succeed in the California court system, but it may make its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court to determine its constitutionality at that level. Um, so with that, I know everyone's got uh, a busy schedule and, and we weren't able to get to every question that was submitted, um, but to the extent um, you have ongoing questions, Chris's and my emails are part of the material, so feel free to reach out to us. We'd be happy to uh, discuss these issues uh, with you uh, by phone or, or, or by email if, if that's appropriate. So Mia, with that, I will um, turn it back to you and thank you very much for uh, everyone joining us. Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation. Uh, very well organized and answers, uh, questions well answered. So thank you for that. So everyone um, should receive their MCLE certificate within 24 hours um, and check out the Beverly Hills Bar Association website for additional fantastic webinars. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.